Everybody knows the pervy anime character trope, but what happens when somebody tries to become the pervy creep? Today we're gonna find out. But first, coffee break. What's better than writing another compendium of D&D characters? Doing so with some good old liquid productivity. Many Worlds Tavern is the fusion of high fantasy and coffee that I didn't know I needed. That is, until I tried my personal favorite, Great Old One, named after the true Great Old Ones of the Sea, Crustaceans. It is now a constant companion at my game table and world building sessions. Many Worlds also donates $1 of each sold bag to a gaming related nonprofit, so you can be a hero while ordering your coffee. What's even better than ordering coffee and helping those in need? Buying dice. But you can now satisfy that need with the Treasured Realm coffee. It's a limited run, but it comes with a numbered card, sticker, a 5e magic item, and dice. As tribute to the Crab King, this company offers a 10% discount to the first 100 that enter through the link in the description. See you there! That said, roll post. After setting up a new group, I found myself with a fair bit of downtime, so I decided to run a few one-shots with people who didn't apply before the group filled up to pass the time and get some new ideas. One of them sends me this concept. Player. Alright, so this guy was in Academy for a while and was kind of a loser. His friends were losers and no one else liked him. Until another girl from another town took interest in him and asked him out. It turns out she worked for another organization who wished to purge his bloodline, and she almost killed him. But, as he lay dying, another girl from the academy came to him and made him an offer. She was truly a powerful demon and wanted a patron. While I think his backstory is semi-interesting, it doesn't take much googling to realize this is basically the same plot as High School DxD. I sighed, but was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Either he'd be an actually decent player with a bad first impression, or I would have a funny story to tell. Since I'm here, I think we can guess how that one went. Session Zero comes around and the party does their cliché, they meet in a tavern, song and dance. Since I'm a bit tropey myself, I'll be honest. I'll usually start these as a way to introduce the hometown and some important NPCs. Me. All right, you've met up and you're all sitting around the table. What do you want to do now? Player. Is there a bathhouse? Me. Hmm, yeah. You can see the doors leading to the baths at the back. Player. I want to peek in the women's bathrooms. Oh boy, here we go. I've dealt with stuff like this occasionally and can get people to knock it off usually by letting them know actions have consequences or they'll rage quit when I don't give them what they want. Me. Okay, roll stealth. Player. Rolls about a 17, and I roll a perception. 16. Me. Alright, there's two women lower in the hot springs. Backs to the door. Player. Are they naked? Me. You can't tell they're facing away and neck deep in the water. Player. I want to go inside and see for myself. I rolled. As you open the door, it makes a decently loud creak. The women turn around, then quickly become shocked and cover themselves. One saying, well, What are you doing? Get out before I tell my husband. The player, growing a bit frustrated, I uh, run back to the table with my companions. The other players, still miraculously in character, start chewing him out for what they deem a stupid move, when eventually, a broad-chested man enters, one of the women in tow. Man, are you the one disturbing the peace tonight? Uh, me? No, it's the Tarask up there. Of course I mean you! Oh no, the pervert hurt itself in his confusion. I don't usually condone humoring these guys, but the player has dropped the ball so hard you can feel the impact from his mom's basement, and the DM is just toying with him at this point. He could pull the plug on the session, but he's allowing that guy to socially self-mutilate while fighting against his worst enemy, the consequences of his own actions. Speaking of consequences, it's time for our most hated game on the channel, 
of course I'm talking about what happens next. So, that guy has gotten stomped at every attempt to be the worst example of humanity we have. What happens next, Krabos? Does he A. Get in an ill-advised fight B. Rage quit Or C. Start terrorizing a female party member I'm all out of sand dollars, actually, so my buddy Shell is, is officially up for grabs. What happens next? Let's find out. The player, apparently still trying to prove he can get out of this, tried throwing a punch at the captain of the guard. He did not roll well on that, or on the subsequent save against a grapple. Man. Spying on women bathing and attacking a member of the guard, you're under arrest under charges of disturbing the peace. I hear a subsequent disconnect from the player and start laughing hysterically. A fair chunk of the party apparently found this just as funny as I did. We finished up the session fine enough after that and I check my DMs to find one last message from the player. And that guy's long, grand tirade consisted of... The F word and the R word that ends with tard. Okay, I'm gonna keep my monetization today. But the garbage eagle has landed on a new dumpster fire, some game, somewhere far away from here. But we're not done yet. Next post. The cheater and their cookie assault. My partner and I had joined a new D&D 3.5 group a number of years ago. Most of the group knew each other, my wife, a friend, another couple, and the DM. The DM, however, wanted to bring another player he describes as someone who is really good and has played for years. We are okay with it because we trust the DM. Let's call him Phil, after the name Zaphod Beeblebrox went by at the party he met Trillian at in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So the session begins. Phil seems nice and we chat and get into the game. He comes across as having a bit of interpersonal issues, but minor. And A, we all have our hangups, so all is good. A couple of sessions in, Phil makes a roll, and there is some confusion about what he was doing, so another player offered to help him as he was a second edition guy and not very well versed in the 3.5 rules. He hesitates, but his DM friend tells him to accept the help to get the game moving. He relents, but does not hand the paper over. He simply relaxes the hand to let the other player take it and was very passive in a way that shouted, Something ain't kosher here. Everyone is staring at the sheet as the player takes it. It turns out the character sheet was blank. We had not noticed because he kept things in front of it, obscuring it, but it was blank. The DM let him make a character, but never checked it, and it turns out he never made one. This has to be the smartest man I've ever seen on the channel. I've heard people fudging their sheets, I've heard of people fudging their rolls, but no, real chads don't write anything at all. The game's made up anyways. Truly, he is the wisest gaming philosopher of our time, but his wisdom doesn't end there. He has more life lessons to dispense upon us. Roll post. That was when I noticed his d20. It was an old D20 from one of the basic expert sets from the 1980s. In those days, they were made of cheap plastic that tended to chip, and over the years, the D20 would become more and more spherical. They also did not have the numbers filled in, and you had to use a crayon to smash wax into the groove of the number to be able to read it. Yeah, it had no wax, and the numbers were worn away enough to make them hard to read. Even with a close-up look, let alone the quick roll and shout of a result the player was giving, we chided him but let him stay. He made a character, and we let him use dice that were readable. Everything was fine, and we were getting along. Until the cookie! Just before continuing on about the cookie, I want to express my deepest sorrow over the fact that our greatest mind has been imprisoned and constrained. 
bound to the rules of mortals that care not for his wisdom. What's next? You're not gonna let him take as many free actions as he likes? Maybe bind him to the rules of physics? Tyrannically bog him down with having to roll a die in the first place? Nonsense, I tell you. I fully condemn OP and demand that they free our hero from their clutches. Anyways, I just needed to express my rage. Uh, roll post. One of the players made cookies for us. She liked to bake, and since her and her fiancé's apartment was our play space, she really went beyond and made cookies. Super sweet of her. So we took a break and chatted about this and that. It was really fun. I don't think Phil was over it, and I don't think the cookie baking host was either, because they started to bicker. Not angry, but not perfectly civil. Suddenly, Phil throws the cookie at her. The cookie was large, maybe 5 inches or 12 centimeters in diameter. They were also thick and while not solid, they were firm. Firm enough to break a mark as she ducked her head down to avoid the cookie flying straight at her face. The mark was not simply one you could wash away. It dented the plaster and the drywall. I could comment about the construction, but you know. She blew the lid, ordered him out. The DM apologized and we broke up for the night, but Phil was never invited again. On this day, Krabs, a reasonable man was made to do unreasonable things. He is the killdozer of our time, truly astonishing. Expecting people to just, uh, follow the rules and enjoy the game is stupid at best and bad ethics at worst. For shame. Anyways, another one, we'll post. My sincerest condolences to my GM. At least he has a sense of humor. In a 5th edition campaign, we have four people. Kobold Rogue, Goliath Fighter, Human Cleric, and Tortle Artificer, who have been following the trail of a massive black market necromancy trade. With the implication that an army was going to appear within three weeks if we didn't stop it. We had taken out a major provider of bodies. Cleric's dad a noble in the neighboring city, and now we're following the trail to the center of the continent to a city known as Tantamont. On a humorous yet relevant side note, I'm the most recent addition to the group, and I learned that they were accompanied on and off by a falling god. Because of the nature of his falling, this god of chaos has taken the form of a raccoon, and because we don't know his real name, the fighter has dubbed him Tony. My artificer is wary of him, but does her best to behave and be at least a little respectful. In turn, he occasionally gives the team tokens of wild magic in the form of chicken nuggets. If we eat them, we roll on a 1d10,000 table to see what happens. As you can guess, the game is a more lighthearted one, though we take our duties seriously. We arrive in Tantamont. We eat, we gamble a bit in the local casino, and try to get to know the area. After a couple days of searching, it turns out that there's several warehouses full of dead bodies waiting to be resurrected into an army that are well guarded. My artificer notices that these warehouses have several open windows at the top, probably to help mitigate the smell, and the guards don't look up often. Because of this, we start planning how to get my homunculus to carry a bomb through said window unnoticed, and eliminate that resource. The team even offers to create a distraction for the guards. Enter stage left. Tony, fighter, offered him a snack, and as thanks, he offers us a couple of wild magic chicken nuggets. The fighter eats his and rolls, but we don't learn what happened until he opens a door to his shop and instead finds a dungeon waiting at the other side. There is a strong smell of gas of some kind coming through, but nothing inherently dangerous just yet as we prop the door open and head in. The GM stated that if the door closed, the portal would be as well, and the door only lasts for 24 hours total. Long story short, we find notes in a warden's office stating that this is a condemned wing of a prison and the gas is fumes from a pool of chemicals that exploded in the lab. We even investigate the area and find said pit, and I take 4 poison damage upon failing a constitution save. 
We determine the bubbling concoction at the bottom of the 6 by 30 foot hole is acidic through the aid of an alchemy kit and a magic dagger owned by our fighter, which can briefly make portals to any location he has seen that's large enough for his goliath hand to fit through. Out of character, the group starts talking about how to neutralize this problem. The GM seemed somewhat insistent that we continue to search the prison, since the gas only poisoned us because we got so close to the source, but otherwise it wouldn't hurt us. The cleric and I were having none of that, as we did not want to risk blowing ourselves up by mistake, nor the gas getting denser as we went. Basic chemistry says you neutralize an acid with a weak-ish alkaline substance, and more googling says lye is basic, and soap is made of lye. The call for the game is over Discord, but I can hear the GM's head is in his hands, as my artificer waddles back outside to a general store to see how much soap he can buy for one gold. He asks in exasperated laughter if we are sure we don't want twice as much since one gold gets five pounds. And I shrug, saying, sure, why not? We're rich, no skin off my nose. Given we just watched the casino get eaten by a herd of horses in our last session, via chicken nugget wild magic, how could a little more soapy goodness be worse than that? Oh, it gets worse. Fighter, rogue, and cleric come out of the dungeon, and cleric volunteers to watch the door to make sure that it doesn't close while I run my errand. Everyone out of character is laughing at the ridiculousness of this endeavor as I politely ask the fighter to open a portal to the chemical pit while we're standing outside the general store, and upon chucking it in, I shout, Close it, close it, close it, close it! He does. There's an explosion that causes the ground to rumble beneath our feet. We look over to see fire and smoke belch out of the store, the cleric diving out of the way to avoid her hair being burnt off. In the distance, we also see several pillars of smoke throughout the city. The fighter calmly walks over and closes the door so that the shop doesn't catch fire, thereby closing the portal. At this point, the GM steps away to take care of his dog and is gone for about 10 minutes while the rest of us laugh about all of the ridiculousness of the game this far. When he returns, the GM sighs. <sighs> Do you guys have any idea what you just did? Turns out, that concoction was a vital ingredient to a summoning ritual and was highly volatile, to the point that anything that wasn't the last ingredient would have caused it to explode. The prison was also where the leader of the whole necromancer syndicate was, the Lord of Tantamont. He had a magic amulet on him that was blocking all divine contact within the city as well, and our explosion destroyed it so the cleric could contact her patron again too, who was worried when the place went off the radar. The gas was supposed to be used as a tool against you in the boss fight, the GM explained. He's vulnerable to fire, and the gas would keep you from using his weakness without killing yourselves in the process. And you blew him up! I'm not really sure who was laughing harder in that moment, us or him. Either way, we don't need to worry about that side of the whole undead problem anymore. Plus, I get to keep my homunculus. And that is how we got two character levels for throwing 10 pounds of soap in a hole. End post. The gang dropped the soap so hard an entire campaign gets shaken off its foundation? This sounds like classic D&D. Any DM can tell you exactly how a really dumb plan ended up permanently changing the course of the campaign. It's one of the few things you can perfectly rely on, chaotic unreliability. That being said, if you enjoyed these stories, do click on the funny boxes to my side here. Till next time.